7 o'clock. It sounds like you guys have a lot of content to cover, so I don't want to wait too long for everyone. People who join us will catch up, but I'm going to start off by introducing myself. First of all, my name is Emily. I work at the Lethbridge Public Library. This is the second uh, event in a new series we're doing called YQL Meets, where we uh, try and connect the, you, the public, with uh, your friendly, knowledgeable local business owners. We are very lucky to have Theoretically Brewing Company with us today. Um, they probably are going to talk about themselves a fair bit, but I just want to read a little thing from their About Us page on their website. They were founded in mid-2012 by Chris Fisher and Kelty Baird. Baird or Bard? Sorry, I wasn't sure. Baird, yeah. Baird, okay. <laughs> As friends and homebrew enthusiasts, Chris and Cal began a journey that would ultimately lead from brewing on the back deck of a West Side house to the establishment and growth of Lethbridge's first microbrewery opening its doors in December 2015. So we um, know you guys have a lot of knowledge to share with us tonight. Thank you again for doing that. To uh, everybody watching, um, I'm just going to ask that you keep yourselves muted so we don't have any background noise. If you have any questions during the program, um, they're happy to answer, just go ahead and type them into the chat and I'll be letting them know that there's a question for them. There's also, I think, going to be some time at the end for a bit of Q&A. And I will also be sharing um, some recommended reads from the library. So um, without further ado, here is the theory of beer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, for anyone I haven't met yet, my name is Kelty and this here is Chris. That's me. And we are the founding owners of Theoretically Brewing Company. So I'm actually going to share a screen because we do have a little PowerPoint presentation set up for you guys. And it's full of fun pictures, which I always find a little bit easier on Zoom. So we'll get that going. Sweet. Um, so I always like to start when we talk about beer. I like to, I'm a history major and I graduated with a history degree from the U of L, so I have to put it to use somehow. Um, so I like to talk a little bit about the history of beer making around the world and, and kind of how it affects what we do today. Um, world history in beer making is actually really quite extensive. Beer is the one beverage that kind of sees humanity through all of our stages of development. And so some of the images that uh, you see before you, the guys kind of on this side with this big jar sitting on the floor, these big long straws coming out of it. This is a beer vessel depiction from ancient Sumeria um, from about 3,500 years ago. And this jar to this side is an Israeli um, strained vessel, which was used in beer making about 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. So um, lots, of, lots of history with beer around the world. Um, back in the day, especially in Europe and highly populated places. Uh, water wasn't safe to drink because of all of the different contaminants that came from society flowing into the headwaters and into the rivers. Um, we didn't have modern sewage systems, that kind of stuff. So the water got quite contaminated quite quickly. And the only safe beverages to drink were things that had gone through a process. So fermented be beverages like beer and wine um, honey wine called mead as well. All of these are kind of contingent in human history with beer being um, one of the better documented ones for things like, this is what you drank for when we were building the pyramids. This is what we drank when we were going to church. This is um, a beverage that has been with human beings throughout history, regardless of age or gender since basically the beginning of written history, which makes it so, so fascinating for a history major who now became a brewer, so. Um, there are also a lot of recipes that you can find even going back to those ancient Sumerian uh, tablets and everything, so. Yeah, the oldest beer recipe in the world is, uh, the oldest written down one is from China and it's about five or 6,000 years old, so. Um, those are very fascinating. And then as well as um, old songs that include beer recipes uh, to the uh, Sumerian brewing goddess Ninkasi. So she was, uh, she was responsible for all of the fermented beverages in Sumeria is, is kind of her realm uh, for being a goddess. Through human development um, into Europe in the modern and kind of middle age period, um, we get the rise of what are known as alewives. And I always like to bring up this segment of history because 
brewing is actually a very women oriented history. Um, while the men were out working the fields or going off on the crusades, uh, women would stay behind and they would get everything done in the household and beer brewing was considered a household chore. And eventually uh, ale wives would arise because they would have leftover beer from what their, their families would uh, use. So they would actually take that beer to the local market in their village or town, and they would walk around with these big barrels or firkins under their arms and uh, just pour mugs of beer as people were shopping in the market. And the way that they were recognized is um, the very large, tall black hat that we see here. And so they would be able to stand out in the crowd because everyone would see the hat and they would know, oh, there's an alewife over there so I can go get a drink. And then eventually over time and the development of witchcraft and the, the kind of aesthetic of witches with the tall pointy black hats, that's kind of where that aesthetic came from is these women are selling potions that alter humans' perceptions and moods. They must be magical. Um, so that actually gave rise to some of the witch hunts as well. So it's a very complex history that we're diving into. And then that follows all the way through up to more recent brewing history, which in Alberta includes prohibition. So a brief note on prohibition in Alberta, we've actually had two prohibitions. Um, the first era of prohibition was in 1885 and only lasted a couple of years. And then the second era of prohibition was from 1916 to 1924. And that's where these images come from. Um, these are not specifically Alberta images. They are from the internet. So I assume that some of them are from the United States, which also went through an era of prohibition a little bit after ours. Um, and essentially you weren't allowed to brew beer or make any form of alcohol during these times. It was considered dry. Um, the only places you were allowed to have alcohol during prohibition times were hotel lobbies, um, which actually meant that Lethbridge, the Lethbridge Brewing Company, which existed during our second prohibition, wound up buying up a bunch of the motels in town and hotels. And so you could only have their beer in their hotel. Um, and then the other thing was for medicinal purposes, you were still allowed to have alcohol. So um, doctors would write prescriptions, which is fascinating. Yeah, that's right. Prescription beer. Prescription I beer. I reading about that earlier on. Yeah. So in terms of Lethbridge's brewing history, we actually have a very rich and healthy history of brewing beer. Some of you may remember the House of Lethbridge Pilsner that used to be made here right up until 1989. Um, that big brewery, which used to sit right where Brewery Gardens is now, um, that brewery actually was founded as the Lethbridge Brewing Company back in 1901 under Fritz Sick and Emil Sick, his son. And then they sold to Molson in about 1953 or 56. And then Molson ran the plant and then closed it in 89 and actually tore the building down in 1991, which is unfortunate because it was a really beautiful um, structure. So Lethbridge has a great history of making beer. Between the closure of the Lethbridge plant and the opening of our microbrewery in 2015, we didn't have any brewing in the city. So we had like a 25 year period about where there just wasn't any brewing here, which is fine. We brought None, it back. None professionally. I mean, home yeah. brewing obviously was always a thing. The Lethbridge Home Brewers Association, they, they've got a pretty active presence all over the place. Yes. Here in and they are a wealth of knowledge. So if you've ever wanted to get into uh, home brewing at all, Lethbridge home brewers, uh, they're sometimes referred to as the word hogs, which I love. Um, and uh, they're a great resource as well. So that kind of brings you up to where we're currently at. Does anyone have any questions about history and beer making and that kind of stuff? Not a question, but I just want to say how cool it is, the whole alewives trivia thing and the connection with witchcraft. I would have never, ever guessed. So mind is blown already at 710. Yeah, and a lot of people don't think of the brewing industry as something that's really quite female dominant because it's not right now. Um, when beer making was kind of industrialized in about the 1850s with the rise of um, Coors in Colorado, which is still one of the largest producers in the world, as well as Molson in Montreal. Um, once, once industrialization came in, 
women weren't really expected to work in factories like breweries, especially in 1850. It was very not done. Um, so the uh, it, it was very much a male oriented and male dominated industry and we're slowly bringing it back to the cottage industry that it originally was with craft beer. And because of that, we're seeing a lot more women being involved in the industry, which is absolutely phenomenal. Only 2% of breweries right now have any female brew staff at all, which is way too low. Um, we're looking forward to that, seeing that number change dramatically. Uh, Alberta is actually leading the way on that. Our, we're sitting in about a 15 to 16% rate for uh, female brew staff in the province, which is really, really neat. Yeah. Awesome. Chris is actually the pro who got me into brewing. So we started by me sipping a bunch of his homebrew around a fire one night. And I was like, this is really good. You should sell this. And he was like, whatever, bring me a business plan. So I brought him a business plan. Now we own a brewery together um, is the short version of that. But he's actually going to talk all about the brewing process and a lot of technical stuff, which is super fun. I promise it's not too nerdy and boring. We don't, well, we we're trying to make it not that way. You should ask Kelty the long story about how that all started because it involves the biggest game of chicken I think either of us have ever played in our lives. Yeah. Okay, so the process of brewing beer, I'm gonna go through the whole process with you a little bit here, and then we're gonna open up things up for questions. Uh, beer starts with a farm. Uh, so a farmer will decide to plant malt barley. Uh, malt barley is a bit different from feed barley in that it's got a lot more starch in it, a lot less protein. Uh, feed barleys that, that animals would eat would have more protein, less starch in it. They're genetically adjusted to, to have those traits. Sorry, do we have a question here? Uh, Chris is Mike a bit closer, so you oh. just talk louder. Okay, I, I can talk louder. Okay, I can yell. also uh, get a little closer to the mic. Is that better? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? That sounds louder to me. Okay, okay cool. perfect. I uh, can never really tell with microphones sometimes. Anyway, a uh, farmer decides to plant because the market conditions are right and he thinks he's got a good shot at making a decent crop, decides to plant malt barley. And so he plants it, grows over the summer, and you end up with barley kernels at the end. You harvest it and the farmer then sells it to a maltster. The maltster takes that barley, adds a little bit of water, a little bit of air, and a little bit of heat and sprouts it. And at the end, you end up with malt. And there's a picture of it right there in, I have no idea whose farmer's hands that is, but hopefully it's some, somebody from Southern Alberta. Uh, we make some of the best malt barley in the world around here. So that you can see the barley kernels have just started to sprout there. You can see the tiny little acrospire, those little white shoots coming up. Uh, after which point the maltster then kills the barley. He dries it out and then roasts it just like coffee. So you can get malts that have different colors to them, caramel colors, you can roast them all the way to black, black, black. Um, and that's how you get your Guinnesses, your Stouts, your Porters, our BHB. Um, if you leave it just like that, you have very, very light malt. Uh, that's how you make your Pilsners and your IPAs and things. Once that malt is done, uh, we go into the actual brewery. So we would buy the malt barley from the maltster. And then the first part of the process is introducing that uh, malted barley to hot water called mashing. And there's a whole little flow chart there that includes all the different steps in brewing beer. Uh, mashing is essentially making barley tea. Uh, what happens is that sprouted barley now has enzymes in it, which breaks starches down into sugar. And the barley tea turns into this nice uh, color is either light or dark, depending on the beer you're trying to make. But this is this nice, sweet um, malt water. We call it wort. Uh, Kelty mentioned the wort hogs there. So that's a play on words there. Um, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, we strain the grain out of it after that point. It takes about an hour and it's, it's done with hot water up to 60, 65 degrees Celsius. And then we louder it. Louder it is essentially a word for it. We spray more hot water over it because we want to take all the sugar out of that barley. And just to give you an idea, um, the dry barley that goes in is the same weight as the wet barley that comes out. So we extract exactly the same amount of sugar from the barley as it absorbs water, which is kind of a really weird thing because normally you'd think that you know wet things are much heavier than dry things, not in this case. Uh, we take that wort and we pull that out of the louder tun. Uh, tuns are just big vessels. I'm not sure why they're called a tun. I'm sure it's an old English word somewhere. Uh, and we put it into the boil kettle. 
And the next step is boiling. And that part pasteurizes the beer. Uh, it also allows us to add in our hops at that point in time. The first hops farms in Alberta are coming in in Vauxhall and places like that. And we're kind of excited to, to uh, be brewing with some local hops as well. Yeah. Hops? Hopses? Hops. Hops. Yeah. Local hops. <laughs> um, the, the longer you boil your hops, the more bitter the beer gets. So if you want a really, really bitter beer, you add a whole bunch of hops and you boil it for a long time. And if you'd want a sweeter beer, you just add a little bit of hops, maybe boil it only for 10 minutes or something like that. This is actually the process that makes the beer um, safe to drink, safer than sometimes than, um, than water coming out of the ground. One question for you. Yeah. Uh, Leora wants to know if hops are strictly for the flavor. No. No. Uh, the hops also has a fairly strong antimicrobial property to it. So it's also for preservation. Uh, a lot of very heavily hopped beers during the British Empire were shipped on very slow sailing ships around the world. And the hops was added to make sure that the beer that got from Britain to the destination. India Pale Ales are named for that. Uh, they were actually brewed in Britain and then shipped to India, uh, these pale ales that had a lot of hops in them. So a lot of breweries, uh, especially micro and craft breweries, will not add any extra uh, preservative or anything to their beer to extend shelf life. Um, some of the major domestic brands that you can get, uh, those are the, the big guys who make a lot of beer, um, those big companies, they'll add a couple of different preservatives into the beer. Um, but the, the hops are basically the only thing that we would add to kind of prevent aging of the beer. So we don't add any extra preservatives. Yeah. Or really, I mean, really any other additives to our beer. Yeah. Um, this is a good place to talk about the difference between craft beer and mass manufactured beer. I think so. Do we have a couple of questions? Yeah, so um, Ken had just asked, if beer tin is the same as whiskey tin, it is as, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading, oh. It is an old English word for barrel loosely translated. Large cask is what large cask is what I know it as. Sorry oh. for garbling that. Oh, of the word ton. ton. Makes perfect nice. sense to me. Yep. A ton is a large cask. It holds a ton of beer. <laughs> I'm sure that's not actually the right word, but. Yeah, so um, a couple of differences between the craft brewing industry as we exist in it and the macro brewing industry or the domestic brewing industry as it exists in the market. There are some significant differences between what we do in our size of system and what they do in their capacity. Um, so the, the domestic breweries have been dominating the market in North America since the end of Prohibition because anyone who existed during Prohibition, if they were small, they pretty much stopped their business and weren't able to continue. The larger breweries, including the one that used to exist here, survived prohibition by making soft drinks. And the other fun story out of the Lethbridge Brewery is they used to rent out cooler space in the refrigeration for uncured or unprocessed wool coats or fur coats in the wintertime. Um, well, not in the winter. They would store them in the summer in the refrigerated area because they weren't tanned. Um, so Lethbridge Brewery survived by providing cold storage for fur coats and soft drinks, which is where the term soft drink comes from because it doesn't contain alcohol and alcohol was considered hard. Um, so because those big breweries survived prohibition, they were able to actually change laws in different jurisdictions, including Alberta, where they basically prohibited the setup of small or, or small breweries like ourselves for the vast majority of a century. It wasn't until 2013 when the province um, like basically pulled back legislation from the 1920s that said they had a minimum capacity requirement in the province. And in 2013, that capacity requirement went from 500,000 liters a year down to zero. So before that capacity requirement was removed from Alberta, if you wanted to start a brewery, you had to start at 500,000 liters a year, which is a lot of beer to make. You need a big system. Um, there's a lot of, of logistics and a lot of investment that needs to go into that. Um, after 2013, they reduced that minimum capacity requirement to zero, 
which is why starting in 2014, we see the boom that Alberta has been experiencing in the craft beer industry. Before 2013, there were only six operational breweries in the province. We are now sitting at 140. So that's really cool. Yeah. We were number. We were number 24. 24? Yeah. So we're old now. We're five. Quiet. Quiet here. <laughs> so yeah, so that's kind of the difference between um, microbreweries and, and domestic breweries, as well as just the scale at which they produce. Um, one of my favorite examples is a Molson plant, the, or as an example, the Labatt plant up in Edmonton, right along um, Gateway there, right as you drive into the city. They will put more beer down the drain in one day than Chris and I can brew in a full year. So just to give you a scale <laughs> of how much more product they're able to make. Yeah, yeah their wastage is our production. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually funny. Another difference that I'd want to point out between craft brewing and macro brewing is on the ingredient side of things. Yes. So a macro brewery, they're all about, I'll just come right out and say it, they're all about maximizing the profit for their shareholders, right? They're in it to make money and they will use the cheapest ingredients possible. Uh, still quality enough that you get beer out of the deal, like, so they're not, they're not not making beer by any means. But like they will throw in a large amount of rice or corn or beech wood for flavor uh, if you're drinking Budweiser, for example, uh, into the beer um, just because there are economies of scale to be had there. And if you can cut a cent off of your can of beer uh, at a Molson scale, you're actually making a fair bit of money. Yeah. Whereas we take the a bit of a different approach where we're trying to make something where the beer is a little bit more about the experience. It's about where it came from. It's about appreciating, you know, good quality products or ingredients, I should say. And which and wind up making good quality product? The the difference, like you can taste it. Yeah. Go ahead. I dare you. One of the really I fascinating things about the ingredient market from a microbrewer's perspective is as we were starting up, we found a lot of craft maltsters starting up as well. So these are farmers. Uh, the one that we use regularly is Red Shed and they exist in Penhold, Alberta, which is just south of Red Deer a little bit. And uh, they're like a fourth or fifth generation barley farmer who decided to plant up all of the land they had with malting barley. And one of their, their sons went to school to become a maltster. So he actually went and took a master's in brewing and malting over in Denmark, which is one of the only places in the world where you can do that. And he is now a master malter. And so he, we actually go up to the farm fairly regularly because the brewing industry is really friendly. We all make beer and um, we can go out to the fields and we can test their soil if we want to. We can see what they're spraying on their crop. We, can, we know the quality of the crop coming in. And we're also really good friends with that family now. So if they have something new that they want, they want us to experiment with, we'll throw it into a batch of beer to see how it behaves. Or if we have concerns about a quality of a bag that came down, they will replace it for us immediately. And it's just that really tight relationship with our, our craft growers. Um, and these are, these are farmers who now have a guaranteed market for their product, which is absolutely phenomenal. And it really supports the local industry here. I was gonna say, yeah, it's a local market too. Yeah. Yeah. So back to the process. We were at right. the boiling stage. Where were we? Right. Okay. So our wort is boiling and we've thrown hops in. So it's bittered wort. Uh, it is almost ready to become beer, but you can't throw a bunch of yeast into boiling wort because it'll kill the yeast. So the next step is cooling. And this is where I am a little embarrassed to say this is where our least efficient processes in our brewery, brewery are. Mm -hmm. um, we use water, cold tap water uh, to cool our wort. And as a result, we have a lot of water that we end up unfortunately wasting. wasting. Um, we're looking at ways of trying to get that water to a productive use, mm -hmm. uh, like for gardens or things like that. But unfortunately, you get, uh, it's the first law of thermodynamics. You get nothing for nothing. You have, if you've got to cool down boiling water, you got to warm up cold water. Yes. That's just the way it is. Uh, we cool our wort down to about room temperature, and then we pitch in our yeast. And the yeasts, there are thousands of different varieties of them. 
Um, some ferment, they sit on the top of the beer and they ferment things. Some sit on the bottom and they ferment things. Some ferment at hot temperatures, some ferment at cold temperatures. Um, all of them produce different flavors. All of them give you different results. Some settle out faster, others leave a little haze in the beer. Uh, there are so many different ways that you can use yeast to convert the sugar into carbon dioxide and alcohol. Sorry, I see we have a question here. Where do we source our yeast from? Um, so the yeast that we use in the brewery is sourced from a clean lab called Scott's Labs and they are a Canadian company. Uh, they, we used to source from their Ontario lab. We're now sourcing from their Vancouver lab because they are nationwide now, which is cool. There's a couple of different um, yeast producers in the brewing industry that we can source from. White Labs is one, Raft Labs is one uh, that just actually opened up in Calgary and they're more of a quality control than a yeast provider. But all of this is lab grown. So we don't use a lot of wild, we don't use any wild yeast in our processes at all. We, um, we try to keep those out actually. Yeah, because they, they all, they'll ruin the product. Um, but there's, like Chris mentioned, there's thousands of different types of yeast. There's, there's a lot. So we have a lot to choose from and they can dramatically influence the flavor of the beer. There are some yeasts that are regionally specific. So Kvike yeast is a Norwegian yeast. Um, it's very popular in the brewing industry right now. Kvikes are a new style that are hitting the North American market. And they, we don't have plans for one yet, but Old Man River out by the pass is brewing one and it's delicious. And Kvike specifically imparts a cherry flavor into the beer without ever adding the fruit to it. So. If, it's really, really unique and weird. There's also a researcher at the University of Lethbridge who is doing some studies into brewer's yeast. And she is genetically modifying brewer's yeast to produce different flavor compounds in the beer. Um, so she is trying to target vanillin compound. Uh, so the beer will have a vanilla note to it without ever adding vanilla, which is expensive and difficult to farm. Um, and then also isothumulone, um, molecules as well which are the predominant flavor of hops so you'll you'll be able to do like a double dry hop IPA without actually double dry hopping it because it'll the yeast will just produce the hop flavor itself so that's a lot of really interesting uh, scientific experiments that are going on in the brewing industry right now and I know Phillips is working on it as well yeah sorry where was I you're in um, we had a cooling down fermentation Yep. yep, we threw our yeast in. Um, the yeast converts the sugar in the wort to alcohol and carbon dioxide. And so we let that sit for, in our case, about 10 days. In the summertime, sometimes we can pull it out a little faster. In the wintertime, sometimes we have to wait a little longer. Uh, during this latest cold snap, we had a batch of beer we had to let sit in the tank for a month. Uh, but that's just nature taking its course. Uh, some breweries temperature control their fermentation vessels. Ours is a very, very simple system, so ours does not. Uh, once that time is up, it's time for packaging. So we throw in a little bit of sugar to kickstart the fermentation process again, make a little more CO2, and then we put it into containers. And that CO2 carbonates the beer naturally. Uh, we don't add any CO2 in at the end of the process. We all just let, let time and nature take its course. And at the end of another, say, 10 days to 15, uh, the beer is carbonated and ready to be drunk. Yeah, so start to finish, uh, brew day will take about eight hours of physical labor in the actual brewing process, including a bunch of cleaning because brewing is mostly cleaning. Um, and then the, process, the full fermentation and packaging process will take anywhere between uh, 21 days to a month, depending on the time of year and the style of beer, because they all have different treatments that they need to go through. And some yeasts are finicky, more finicky than others. Sometimes yes. you want to leave more time for the hops to give it more flavor or less. Yeah. So the process as it used to happen um, with an ale wife here, you can see all of those different vessels in various different formats here. Some of these are going to be wood, some of them are going to be clay. Um, but you have the ale wife who's pouring her barley into the mash tun there is what my imagination is telling me. You've got the boil kettle in the back there. That's the thing that's making smoke. It's probably just a burner. She's going to put a big kettle on that later to, to boil more water or bring her work to temperature or whatever. Uh, you see in the back, you see there is this, looks like a, a big barrel thing with a stick sticking out of it. And at the bottom, it looks like a spigot. 
going into another bucket, essentially. Yeah. So this would be the loudering process. And then the casks are there on the right. They'd be old, old school wooden casks. There'd be very little quality control of this kind of beer. You wouldn't know exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get different results depending on the season, different results depending on what you added to it or what you had available, different results depending on what's living on the inside of the barrel. Um, a lot of sour beers will be, are, uh, that are they were popular a year or two ago. Are they still popular? They're still very popular, yeah. I figure. They're pretty tasty, actually. Um, but that's, that's deliberately taking another microorganism and using it to sour the beer a little bit to give you that tangy flavor to it. So that's how simple the process can, can get um, yeah. in the old school way of doing things. Which is also why like, it's been around since literally the beginning of time for humans is we figured out fermenting uh, grain-based beverages really early. And actually there's really solid evidence that every culture across the world had some kind of version of beer at one point, uh, which is really, really neat, including like the Incas and the Mayas and, and all of them, it's really fascinating because any grain that has car complex carbohydrates in it can be broken down into simple sugars and create ethanol with the addition of microorganisms, which is really cool. Yeah. People don't really think about it, but beer is actually the universal human beverage. Yes. Surprise. <laughs> beer and water. I mean, we always, humans have always been drinking water. So these are some shots of the back deck where we used to brew with Chris. Um, My hair was less gray. This is our homebrew setup right back from the day. It's a simple pot with a couple other pots and some buckets kicking around. We used to use a Coleman cooler as our mash tun because it would trap the heat well enough. Um, this is a very simple setup. You can, you can put it together really cheaply and you can make beer at home. Um, there's also kits you can get. So if you don't want to work directly from barley, you can get a wort extract, um, which is like, basically we take out the first couple of steps in the process and make it really simple. And then you just add water and boil it essentially. And then hit your yeast after you've cooled it down. And then the second picture on this slide is our fermentation tanks being built. They were built right here in town by Charlton and Hill, which was fantastic. Um, Charlton and Hill actually built all of our brewing system for us. Uh, so we were able to really work with them and custom design our tanks. And our fermenters are actually quite tall. Um, so the next slide shows Chris being a goo, as well as just how tall our fermenters are. And most fermentation vessels in the industry are actually quite low to the ground. Um, the bottom of the cone this guy will actually sit just six inches above the ground. We had ours raised so we can conveniently fit buckets underneath so we wouldn't have to mop as much because I'm lazy and I don't like cleaning. But brewing is 90% cleaning, about 10% paperwork and 0.1% shenanigans. And somewhere in there beer is made. So yeah, that is actually the, the slideshow and kind of our prepared notes. Uh, we are very happy to open up a discussion if you guys would like to have one. This is our favorite topic, so we're more than happy to keep talking about it. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I um, learned a lot. Like, I thought I knew a little bit about how beer is made because um, my dad likes making beer and he has been my whole life, but I did not, either I haven't been paying attention to him or he doesn't know as much as I thought he did. Somewhere in there, um, I learned quite a lot today. So thank you so much. Does anyone have questions? And if you would like to unmute or um, to turn on your video, you are very welcome to. Please do note that um, we are recording this for our YouTube page. So, so long as you're comfortable with that, um, or you can continue to use the chat. And I do see a question from Ken. Um, so Ken's question is, how do you test the impact that various yeasts might have on the finished product? Um, that's a great question. So there's a couple of different things that we look for in a yeast style. The stuff that's lab grown has a bunch of data that comes with it. So we do know how it will behave, what temperature we need to ferment at, um, what flavor compounds it will throw into the beer at different temperatures. For example, um, we use a Belle Saison yeast in our uh, Hefeweizen, which is a Belgian style of yeast. That's where it originally comes from, um, but it is lab grown in Canada now. And that yeast at 
20 to 25 degrees will throw in flavors of banana, cloves, and coriander. But once you hit 28 to 35 degrees, those flavors will turn to bubblegum. So depending on the flavor profile you want to put in the beer, you let your temperature rise or you temperature control it. Um, lagers, as an example, use a very mild yeast strain. Um, very, very standard. They're actually cold fermented. So they're fermented for longer and at lower temperatures around the 14 degree mark Celsius. Or even 10. Or even 10. 10 so Celsius. quite cold. And those take longer, but their flavor profile is more subtle and more reliable. So yeah. So when it comes to different yeasts, uh, if we're getting them lab grown, then they come with a bunch of data. But then we get into the wonderful and wacky world of wild yeasts. And that's an interesting one. So wild yeast, um, Toolshed actually did this a couple of years ago where they cool ship beer. A cool ship is a large vat um, that you put your wort in after the boil, but before fermentation. And you let air pass over it. And what Toolshed did is they took out their cool ship out on the back of a pickup truck and drove oh, it up a field. prairie road and into a farmer's field. And everything that was in the air passing over that liquid got trapped in the liquid. And they made a beer out of it because there were wild yeasts in there and it was funky as heck, <laughs> but it was really good tasting. And this is a very old method of brewing beer as well. It's very popular with Trappist Dales in Belgium. Um, they'll literally lift cool ships of beer right up to the top floor of the brewery and the windows will all be open and they'll let the air pass over the cool ship and the yeast will just naturally fall into the into the liquid and inoculate it with all kinds of wild flavors. Um, horse blanket and barnyard are flavor profiles in Travis beer that are supposed to be there. Also leather. Leather. And sherry. Yeah. Um, but those are a little bit more rare on the North American market because we like lagers. We like very tame beers compared to what some of the Europeans make. And then the Kvike yeast as well. Um, I mean, you get cherry flavor out of that and rosewood and a bunch of other things. Like it's, it's insane. So yeah, um, if it's lab grown, we can predict it. If it's wild, there's no predicting it. Pray it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. And if you find a yeast strain that you like, you keep, keep the it. sludge out of the bottom of the bottle and you grow some more of it. Yeah. And do it again. Yeah. Like a sourdough starter. Absolutely. Exactly. Sourdough is actually fermentation. It's, yep. it's, it's what happens to grain before it's malted. Yeah. Okay, there, well, and, if there aren't any more questions, oh, sorry, you were going ahead. Oh, are, I was just asking if there are any more questions. Oh, loaded question. Ooh, what are your favorite brews that you make? What's right, your favorite? Right now, my favorites are IPA. Yep. Yep. I like our IPA right now. Ask me again in a month, it'll change. Um, but that's, uh, that is a loaded question. I always like to say I have no favorite children, but that's a lie. It's the porter. Follow up question. What are your respective like food pairings you like with each of those Ooh, or your favorite food with beer in general? Yeah. What do you, what do you eat with the IPA? Curry is really good. Yeah. IPA goes really well with a green curry. Yeah. Um, IPA a goes, fairly spicy green curry. Yeah. Also chicken like wings. Bold flavored food. Sharp cheese. Mm -hmm. Hopefully don't have all three of those things in the same day. <laughs> no. um, for me, for porter, um, I really like like hamburgers with porter. Anything red meat mm. is venison is very good. Um, like really dark winter stews and that kind of stuff. There are some people who argue that beers are seasonal and that light, light beers are more for summertime and dark beers are more for wintertime. That is and isn't true. We do make our stout year round because I like having a dark beer in the summer. It tastes like chocolate and coffee. <laughs> I love it. So <laughs> that's why we keep it around. Um, and then also we make Hefeweizens and stuff through all through the winter. So it's kind of whatever your personal flavor profile is. Um, the other thing I like to do with beers is make beer cocktails out of them. So instead of mixing with a soda, you can actually use beer as a base in a cocktail. 
Um, so that's a nice way to, to play with different beers and, and kind of experiment a little with your flavor profiles. Is there a recipe you'd like to share? Um, take the Steady Buddy half of lights in, squeeze half a lime into it, and drop a shot of gin into it. It's really oh my nice. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some related stuff with the library while people are thinking about any questions they might have. Sure. Um, I'm just going to let everybody know if you hadn't heard the news, the library has gone fine free. So uh, you will no longer incur late fines if you live in Lethbridge when you return your items. Uh, we also have uh, implemented automatic renewals. So if you're not very good at keeping on top of the stuff you've borrowed, we will actually automatically renew it and give it you more time with it if you need more time. Um, memberships are free this year. I don't know that we've secured free memberships forever, but I know they are free this year. And you can actually, if you don't have a card, you can log on to our website and you can get a membership just on our website. And finally, I'd also like to take a moment to share my screen because uh, I made a short little um, book list uh, of some resources from the library uh, related to tonight's topic. Um, here we go. So you should see something that says general recommendations, the theory of fear. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So I have is, Tapping the West and it is a phenomenal book. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that was definitely the first one for my list. So this is just a small sampling of titles that you can borrow from the library. Most of them are available right now. Um, if you would like to uh, do some more reading after tonight's discussion, um, some of them are more history oriented. Some of them are more practical for making your own good stuff at home. I mean, other than, you know, buying from your local brewery. <laughs> but that's how they got started. So um, so don't worry about having to navigate our website to find this. I am going to be sending out an email uh, shortly after the program here with a link to, let's see, with a, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to black that out probably now. I accidentally showed everybody's email addresses. Anyways, <laughs> with a link to um, a survey for tonight's program and also a link to this book list. What about some beer mystery, beer romance, or beer poetry? <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering if I should include some fiction titles. I did just end up going with nonfiction, but maybe I should have been more creative. I, I mean, I don't know of that much beer fiction out there, but I'm sure it exists and I'm sure it's excellent. There's <laughs> poetry out there somewhere. There's well, gotta be, somebody's done. We are all picking up new hobbies in the pandemic. Maybe this is going <laughs> to be a chance to shine. <laughs> Blending brewing. Oh, yes. Um, sorry, there was a question about blending in brewing, and, uh, similar to the wine industry. So you can, in what, the wine industry, you can have blended reds and that kind of stuff. Um, sorry to jump right back into the question. This is a fantastic one. This is groundbreaking in um, the brewing industry. And well, at least it's groundbreaking since like the 1950s. Um, you gotta remember that after North America had our prohibitionary periods, um, mm -hmm we lost a lot of ground in a lot in how beer is made and the kind of innovation that can be done in beer um, because everyone just went straight to brewing like lager, ale, stout, and that was it. Um, so we lost a lot of beer styles for a very long period of time that were produced um, in North America or sometimes even all over the world. So in terms of beer blending, it is coming back into um, process if you're interested in some of the weirder stuff on the market, um, Blind Men Brewing out of Lacombe is doing a lot of beer blending these days. And they're not just blending with other beers, though they are doing that. Um, they are blending with things like wine. So you can have a lager with a Shiraz base or a Zinfandel base, which is fantastic and tasty. Um, you can have beer that's aged in various barrels from other industries. So a popular one is bourbon barrels from Kentucky. Um, there is a law in Kentucky that says bourbon barrels cannot be used more than once. So there's a lot of used bourbon barrels in the market. And what the brewing industry does is we take those barrels and we use them to barrel aged beer product, which imparts a lot of the good bourbon smoky flavor into the beer without actually adding bourbon to the beer. Right. Yeah. Whiskey barrels, the same thing. Tequila barrels, harder to get, 
also the same thing. Um, and rum barrels are extremely hard to get and they do the same thing as well. So you can barrel age, you can blend, you can blend outside of beer, you can blend within beer, you can blend different styles. The trick is knowing your alcohol content at the end of the day, because that's what the government cares about. Yeah. And also whether or not it tastes good. And there whether or not it tastes good. a lot of experimentation left to be done in that particular area. Yeah. And sometimes like what tastes good, a lot of times what tastes good to one person doesn't taste as good to somebody else. So you really have to kind of pick and choose and find your market. Um, the one beauty with craft beer drinkers though is they like the weird stuff. Like we brew six core beers year round, but it we don't do as good as sales as when a new beer hits the market. So um, the next beer that we have coming out is our Women's Day beer. So we launch a beer every year around International Women's Day. It'll probably be a little bit late this year because that cold snap put fermentation time back a little bit. Um, but this year it is a blackberry pineapple smash. So that'll be super fun. Um, we just added the fruit additions the other day and mm -hmm. are waiting for it to finish up. Um, and then there's a lot of other beers coming out. So back to the Women's Day brew though. This year was a little bit different because we couldn't actually have the brew day that we normally do because of COVID. Um, normally we actually kick Chris and all the other boys out of the brewery and our head brewer Kayla and I bring in a team of local volunteers, all women or women identifying people. And uh, we brew a batch of beer together and we teach a whole bunch of ladies how to brew beer. It is super fun. We feed you throughout the day. You taste a bunch of different beers throughout the day. And, uh, and it's just a great time. This year we couldn't do that. So Kayla and I brewed the batch together because <laughs> we were the only two allowed in the brewery and, uh, and we'll launch it. And then proceeds from the sale of that beer will actually go to Harbor House here in Lethbridge. So we've been supporting them for a couple of years now, which is cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's totally fun. <laughs> is there going to be an alewife um, hat on the, the label? That's my biggest we question. I haven't designed the label yet, but uh, <laughs> I might have to look at that one for this year for sure. That's just like, that was the biggest thing I'm leaving with tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> you're leaving with is like the, the witch aesthetic is actually just beer aesthetic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Changes everything. <laughs> yeah. And like the one cool thing with beer and the going back to the kind of the blending conversation and all the innovation, there's literally innovation for beer coming out of all sectors. So we talked a little bit about the genetically modified yeast strains that are being worked on. Um, hops have come a long way. There used to be only maybe a couple dozen varieties of hops grown all around the world. Um, now through genetic selecting and, and crossbreeding different varieties of hops, we can get dramatically different flavors. So classic hops like Hollertauer, one of the oldest breeds from Germany, um, those are very earthy, very piney, like your really classic hop flavor. But now we have stuff like Lemon Drop, which is a product out of Seattle, and it tastes like a lemon popsicle. Like it's sweet, and it makes your beer taste like lemonade. Or um, what's the one that tastes like grapefruit? Uh, citra? Citra basically tastes like we squeezed a bunch of grapefruit into the beer and it doesn't have any grapefruit in it, which is phenomenal. Um, so like all of these different varieties are coming up, even the type of barley that's grown. Um, I mean, we use genetically modified organisms, GMOs, I know, but um, it's the types of barley that are growing, you're getting so much more efficient and so much higher protein and sugar content that they're getting better quality all the time. So we're able to make better beer all the time, which is really cool. Yeah. And new styles are coming out all the time because even though we have style lists, brewers don't pay attention to them very well. So, <laughs> I mean, Village made a Canadian dark lager. Don't know what that is, but it's tasty as heck. So, yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, if there's no further questions, it's um, 7.50, so almost made a date anyhow, probably about time to wrap up the evening. Um, so I'll 
leave it for one more minute to see if anyone else has something they want to ask. But I just want to say that uh, this has been a really fantastic evening. I learned a ton and, and you guys had a great presentation. That was super enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before we sign off, I do just want to shout out the other microbreweries in the area. We're just one. There's also Spectrum Ale Works on the north side. Daryl and Elaine are doing phenomenal beers out of their little setup as well. There's Stronghold Brewing of Fort McLeod, uh, Old Man River Brewing over in Lundbrick, the Pass Brew Co. in the past now, and Tin Dogs is opening up their brew system. We've actually been brewing them with them for a couple of years. And then we have all the guys in Medicine Hat and Brooks as well. So we, again, we went from like six breweries to 140. So You've got a lot of options on the market right now. So support local. For sure. Thank you again.